Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for uh, being here for this last and concluding session of Tech and Innovation Summit. And our last session is on uh, investing in uh, cleaner technology, the role of VCs. And we have, uh, you know, eminent VCs uh, with us. Uh, I want to start. I want my panelists to, you know, share a brief intro about themselves first. Rajiv, we can start with you. Or Swapna. Sure. You want me to share what we do? Should we wait for the room to fill up? This is... Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm Swapna Gupta. I'm a partner at Avana Capital. Uh, at Avana Capital, we invest in climate technologies of today, which can solve for tomorrow in some sense. 75% uh, of technologies which need to solve for tomorrow don't exist and our intention is to invest in some and most of them to help us get to uh, the energy climate transition. Yep. Uh, my name is Shoaib Ali. I'm from Transition VC. Uh, we invest in energy transition as a domain. When I say energy transition, anything to do with uh, any engineering startup or a deep tech startup, which helps reduce your carbon footprint. Uh, typically, invest in EV, EV in this value chain, industrial decarbonization, renewable tech, hydrogen in this value chain, uh, uh, long duration energy storage. These are a few of the sectors or subsectors where we are actively looking to invest. Hi, uh, my name is Ankit Kedia. I'm the founder at an early stage fund called Capital A. We are investors largely in the deep tech, climate, and fintech uh, ecosystem. And idea is to back entrepreneurs and uh, businesses that have uh, some form of uh, uh, revenues and a part to profitability from day one. Uh, need not be profitable from day one, but of course, uh, have some meaningful business plans as they go forward. We're based in Bangalore, uh, have done 25 investments so far, and uh, uh, we are in our year three of year four of deployment technically. Hi, my name is Rajiv Kalambi. I'm a partner at Cactus Venture Partners. Uh, we Typically, inve we invest in three categories, uh, clean climate tech, health tech, and enterprise software. Clean climate tech is close to heart. Uh, it is something uh, that is uh, an imperative, right? Uh, the planet needs uh, people to invest to make uh, the, you know, the planet a better place to live in, right? And so these technologies that are evolving, uh, I guess all of us on this panel uh, across various stages would like to help support companies that are creating uh, businesses which can you know help improve our living conditions uh, we typically come in at uh, post product market fit so companies that have created some technologies which are deployed commercially uh, you know accepted and uh, they are generating some revenues we come in provide the scale capital and help them grow from you know, generally, the, you have the zero to one, which is the hustle when you're setting things up, you're putting things in place, you're trying to achieve your PMF. We come in at the city, at the one stage. So one to 10 is where we uh, typically support companies in their uh, growth endeavors. Priya. Thanks for the intro. Uh, so I begin with asking, you know, why this particular area, sustainability or clean tech, climate tech, is appealing investors these days? And what is there in for the investors? So uh, the question is, what is in it for investors, is it? Yeah, why this area is appealing to investors? So it's so okay. One is the fact that, like I said, it's an imperative, right? Uh, there is a certain amount of tailwinds that uh, you get from uh, regulators, from the government, uh, from uh, consumers, right? Uh, people realize that there are lots of things which were earlier considered as public goods, which now no longer are really public goods, right? It's, it's, being, it's been brought into the domain of the private. And gradually people have to uh, start looking at what they can do to leave a legacy for you know, their children and their grandchildren. Uh, you know, there have been, uh, we grew up in times when we didn't have to contend with so many issues, right? So this air pollution, 
we can see what's happening with uh, water in Bangalore today, right? And in other places, Chennai has faced this problem. Uh, Cape Town in South Africa has faced this problem. And we see a lot of cities across the globe which are facing this problem. Uh, technologies to ensure that we utilize our natural resources in the most optimal way, right? And so that's what clean climate tech is all about. Uh, why, is it this, why is this interesting for us? It's because there are lots of people who are now thinking along those lines. Uh, there was a time when no one gave it any attention, but today you see that there's this groundswell uh, where people, uh, where entrepreneurs and uh, techpreneurs are spending a lot of time uh, focusing on specific aspects, specific areas. Uh, where they can do things better, whether it's in agriculture, whether it is in uh, you know auto automotive, whether it's in uh, construction materials, you know. So there are various spaces, uh, you know, simple things like uh, even uh, you know uh, municipal solid waste, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, everything starts at the individual level. Uh, so there is definitely a mindset change which needs to happen at a very large scale. Uh, to some extent, that started. Right? And we are at that juncture right now. And I think for all of us over here, uh, if, I, if I can say that we are in this because we want to support and encourage uh, and you know, handhold a lot of the companies which are creating these technologies uh, because for them, they have the, uh, you know, the, the acumen, they have the technology, they need capital. And what we are doing is we are bringing in the capital and helping them and supporting them along the way. So Ankit, anything to add there? Uh, did you want me to also uh, answer the similar question, same question? Yeah. Uh, I think climate, again, every year we see have a new blue-eyed boy. Some years it's fintech, some years it's crypto, Web3. I think the new blue-eyed boy definitely is climate. Uh, having said that and done over 10 investments in the climate space, I think uh, it definitely has to be, there has to be some purpose behind investing in climate by one of the GPs or the partners mixed with a purpose of uh, doing business as usual. Uh, without that, climate investing becomes very difficult and it's a bit of a grey area because, you know, what Rajiv spoke about that for the greater good versus now uh, the, the greater good is also uh, an outcome of doing business. Uh, having said that, we've, we've clearly seen that marrying purpose and a business outcome is becoming a lot more, uh, there's a lot more clarity. The initial investments that really went into climate was in the EV and mobility space, a lot of uh, OEMs, a lot of folks who were uh, developing the charging infrastructure, battery swapping, analytics, uh, people who are building power trains, uh, challenging the likes of legacy OEMs. Uh, so, I mean, there's so much uh, new age about this entire climate investing. Of course, it's slightly skewed towards the entire EV mobility side. <clears throat> we are seeing some offshoots of folks uh, getting into space of financing solutions because banks won't underwrite a solar product immediately. Uh, so, we are seeing a little bit of diversity kicking in, but uh, climate investing is not for everyone. Uh, just building a thesis again is not enough. Uh, there is also a learning curve. You have to go through it, uh, learn from it, and then sort of pivot just as the startup founders do. That's my two cents on that. Shoyab, yours is a focused, yeah. based on you know, climate focus. Yeah. So, we are an energy transition fund, so we just do one part of climate. So, climate, it involves everything, energy transition, sustainability, recyclability, and there are multiple things that come into climate. So, from an energy transition perspective, if you look at, uh, so the, the primary reason why we started fund also was if you look at, uh, for the first time, uh, all forces which are government in the form of policy, capital, lot of institutional capital, philanthropic capital, they want to, uh, uh, they have allocated significant uh, amounts of capital, billions and trillions of dollars have been pledged for climate. Uh, third, now we are also seeing a lot of, lot of entrepreneurs coming out and trying to solve these pressing problems. 
so if you look at all the market forces, right? I mean, all these three forces for the first time have converged. So climate, if you look at climate 1.0, 2.0, I, I will call this climate 3.0. They failed because 1.0 and 2.0 didn't had all the participating market forces in them. So first time uh, it has happened that all those forces have come together and are converged. And we see it as an opportunity and the chances of uh, climate 3.0 succeeding is more when compared to 1.0 and 2.0. And the, so everybody knows that there is a uh, global warming, you need to contain the uh, temperature rise and everything. So you have formulated a lot of policies, government push and everything is into that. For us, it's also important from an energy security perspective. If you look at numbers, just India just imports 150 billion dollars worth of oil and oil equivalents. That's huge. So that's the complete hard work of our IT folks who are putting their hard work and are earning those. Like they also export close to 100, 110 billion dollars. So we're just spending completely IT. We are just exporting IT services and just importing oil and oil equivalents. So we see this as an opportunity where if if uh, if India can build few of those technologies in house and can like maybe hydrogen, electric vehicles, uh, fuel cell, cell manufacturing, if, if part of it, the value chain can be done in India. So we would save a huge amount of those reserves. Also, our estimate is that by 2030, the energy transition, when I say energy transition, anything related to buildings, vehicles, industrial industries, renewable tech, and also storage part of it. So if you combine this, uh, roughly it would come around $150 billion kind of a market. And by 2030, that's our estimate. And all of that, we need at least investments worth of like $100, $120 billion worth of investments needs to be done if you have to achieve the goals what we have set ourselves to reach to 2030 goals. And out of that, like $15, $20 billion will be very, I mean, uh, that purely will go into innovation, especially kind of startups or uh, uh, corporates might want to set up their tech arms. So that's a very exciting space now. I mean, so these are all the tailwinds which are pushing us and we believe uh, this is a hot sector and it would remain hot sector for the at least a decade or so. I, I don't have much to add beyond because all the fellow panelists have covered and we all hear each other on a very regular basis. I actually thought maybe if you want to switch gears given the room is very thin, thinly populated, maybe one way of putting the questions not to all of us is maybe we can just take audience questions and answer because the reason I say is all four of us know each other and we talk to each other almost every week. So we know what we are doing. I think it will be better for the audience if there are very specific questions, maybe better to answer them, given it's a smaller room. I, I don't know what do you guys suggest. Okay, I add a few uh, of the questions means um, the audience. Obviously, I'll open the floor for the audience also. So within, uh, you know, within uh, the sector, where is the investment being targeted? You know, which area? Uh, within this uh, sector, if you can talk about, you know, solar or EVs or to me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, from a fund perspective, we are looking at <coughs> uh, five sectors or subsectors what we have clearly drawn. One is uh, in the EV, in the EV value chain. So, we typically, being an early stage fund, we don't do OEMs. We want to invest in companies which are doing battery tech, motor controllers, electronics, which are core of an EV. And also maybe look at few uh, software companies that are doing something there. That's one segment. Uh, uh, second, we are actively looking at industrial decarbonization. We believe industrial decarbonization is a very huge problem to solve, and there we are looking at companies which can, which are, which are looking at like I mean, usage of alternate fuels like hydrogen for industrial processes. Maybe something like like waste state recovery, where you can improve the efficiencies and also reduce your carbon footprint. Uh, third, again, uh, we are also looking at uh, net zero journey for buildings. Within buildings, we want to invest in. IoT software, HVAC optimization kind of softwares which help you to uh, move buildings such as this, which are brown buildings to green buildings. And also, we are also very actively looking at uh, long duration energy storage, which actually currently my team is like working very hard to look at identify right startups there because we believe that is going to be a huge market. Whereas we have seen the boom of EV, which has EV has become a reality today. There's no, it has reached to an inflection point that EV would stay. So till 
three, four years back, it was still in the minds of consumers and the minds of government and the minds of investors also whether EV will become a reality, but that question is not there. Similarly, we see we need with the contribution of renewables on the grid, uh, we believe there will be a huge demand for storage because you need because uh, renewables like solar and wind are morally intermittent. So uh, we're also actively looking at long duration energy storage company startups in India. So these are the few areas what we're actively looking at. So we, um, I mean, there are within clean climate tech, there are several sub segments, right? We actively look at, uh, you know, we are agnostic in that sense, but a lot of our effort and, uh, you know, ideas are focused on uh, uh, renewal, right? So for example, we've invested in a company which uh, is in the lithium ion battery recycling business. So, you know, that's one thing. The other thing that we're looking at is we are not looking at investing in the OEM space, but more in the value chain. So we look at companies that are, uh, we've just sort of looking at a company which is, uh, which is a manufacturer of power trains. We look at uh, municipal solid waste uh, disposal. We're looking at uh, business models where they're looking at recycling plastic, right? And so on. So we, we, we are agnostic. We look across various, uh, you know, categories. But I think Swapna, you all have a reasonably wide uh, you know, coverage within the clean climate space, given their focus. So maybe you can uh, share a lot more. Yeah, for for us, so we try to look at what contributes to almost 90% of India's emissions, and also about 70% of GDP. So the sectors which really are meaningful in that journey to get to climate pathways is supply chain, mobility, energy transition, resource management, sustainable consumption, sustainable agriculture. And between them, if you combine, you see every, and you further start dissecting them into mini sub-segments, you see everything from energy transition, which could be mini grids, decentralization, climate data platforms. In agri, you start looking at water because water becomes important. In sustainable consumption, you start thinking about how to sustainably consume every day across segments. In supply chain mobility, mobility hasn't been disrupted for many, many, many decades. We still transport everything the same way it used to be. So how can you disrupt some of these things and adopt, adopt a path which not only contributes to your mitigation but also think about a country of 1.2 billion, you need to think about adaptation and resilience. So what are the climate pathways? I want, to, want you to answer the same. Uh, in terms of uh, derivatives of climate, right, uh, I think all of, all of us as different VC funds have our uh, some preference on going on a particular sector and then going into the depth of it. For example, what uh, Shoaib does with uh, the EV sector, right? Uh, for us, then we have to break it down to, you know, some, I mean, air, water, wind, uh, and energy and derivatives of that. Uh, for us, we say that, look, let's pick up packaging as a sector, uh, take a look at sustainable packaging, Take a look at what is the value chain on the entire EV ecosystem. Like Rajiv said, that they'll not do OEM. Now, there's a reason why OEM investments are hard. The reason they are hard is because it's a very capital-intensive business. And for anyone to say that I'll put up a factory and set up a product, including sales, marketing, brand. I mean, folks like uh, our legacy brands have. Have, have built the brand over some 70, 80 summers. Uh, and for any new age startup to do that would require enormous amount of capital. We see examples of that, right? Uh, uh, an OEM called uh, River. Uh, they have raised tons of money right now. Now, that capital, you have to see the quality of capital. That, that capital came from two or three strategic investors. Uh, what does it mean uh, for that particular set of uh, founders is they are aligned to have a strategic interest in the startup they founded and go by the guidelines of the strategic interest in the business. So I think every fund has a different uh, uh, lay of land in terms of where, how they want to function. Uh, for us, solar uh, seems to be something which is uh, doing extremely uh, uh, promising uh, steps uh, and a lot of folks in the hardware side of things, a lot of folks on the solar financing uh, side of things. 
are emerging and hopefully uh, do some great work. You talk about this sector, how do you see it? Has it already, you know, taken off uh, for investors or still a lot of scope left? Uh, I mean, just to keep, it's, it's a long answer, but to answer that in a few sentences, every year we see folks who two years ago were averse to uh, investing in climate are suddenly warming up to the climate uh, ecosystem. And the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the, the capital outside of India or the ecosystem outside of India is way more evolved than what we are. And in some way or shape, we take inspiration from global markets. Uh, the government is supporting the policy. They're coming up with, I mean, they came up with a deep tech policy. Obviously, that is still in uh, finishing touches. So I think the government is also doing a lot of things uh, for VC funds to get enough conviction on the climate sector and further investments. Sure, your, your take on this. I'm seeing your take on this. Uh, has this sector still has a lot of scope left? Yeah. Yeah. We just scratched the surface. So if, if you if you just I mean I'm, I'm giving some numbers like I mean if you get. Uh, EV, which is which was which, which was hot sector and still a hot sector. If you look at uh, EV market, right? Uh, there are like India sells roughly 20 million two-wheeler market, two-wheeler vehicles every year. Or that we have a penetration of just five percent two-wheeler market penetration. EV penetration is five percent. If you look at uh, cars, we sell we sell approximately four to five million cars a year in India. The penetration is just one percent. And uh, if you look at three-wheelers. Uh, that's the best sector. Like there are like, we sell roughly half a million three wheelers in India, and all of that the penetration is just like 18, 20 percent. So, so one the innovation happens in phases. I mean, if you just break down the EV part of it, uh, first the innovation happens at the OEMs level. So that is where you got few incumbents being challenged, like Ola either came and challenged them in three wheeler. You have Alti Green. Uh, that is the first level of innovation that has happened at the OEM level. Second, now the innovation what we are seeing is happening at the systems level. When I say systems, these are the subsystems which go into an OEM. That is where you are seeing very good battery tech companies like Exponent, EMO and motor controllers. Uh, after that, again, there will be a shift. I mean, you, once you move back, back of the value chain, that is where you will see a lot of innovation happening in cell manufacturing. Uh, and then you will go back and then you will see a lot of innovation happening in materials that go into cell, anode materials, cathode materials. Similarly, each of the sector will have its own uh, uh, path. So if you if you talk about hydrogen, we are still not even at the OEM level where we don't have the systems also. So everybody is struggling. Uh, we have a lot of PLI schemes and uh, government uh, uh, incentives there, but everybody is struggling to get electrolyzers, fuel cells. So all those subsectors within the energy sector are at different phases and there's a huge opportunity there. We believe it just started and there's a huge opportunity. Want to say in this scope no, of the I sector? mean, uh, I think uh, they've touched upon it saying that, see, uh, this space is very early, right? There is, it's, we've just started. There's a lot that can be done in the space. For example, when we look at the, you know, the, the landscape and we say, okay, where can we get our deals from? we see that uh, there are very few companies that have established product market fit, right? So we come in post product market fit. So whenever we look at any companies, they're either very early or, you know, they've got the technology, they've got a POC, but they've not been able to commercialize, right? So we, we need to come into uh, businesses which have got a commercialized product, which customers are willing to pay for. Uh, at price points which make sure that the company makes reasonably decent gross margins because only if you have reasonable gross margins can you go on to become profitable over time. Uh, and then we also like to see whether the product is being, uh, product, product or service is being used frequently, right? So you want to see whether there is renewal rates, what are the drop off rates, which are attrition. You know, when we look at all these factors, we see that there are very few companies that have reached uh, PMF if you look at it from these parameters, right? Uh, and there's significant scope and potential within this. So what happens is that a lot of the deals that we look at, uh, we look at uh, companies that have been funded by 
swapna ankit and shoaib right because they've come in at a very early level we coming in slightly later to help them grow uh, and when we look at it we see significant uh, you know opportunities over there they're growing we're waiting from this you know subset of companies which have achieved their product market fit that is when we can come in and sort of work with them so there's there's a lot of potential we have just started i think this is a uh, at least from us from a you know fund perspective i think we can you know have clean climate tech as one of our focus areas across three funds maybe even four funds going forward because you know the gestation period for these companies tends to be quite long we are at a stage where a lot of the companies will you know really shine maybe post 5 years later right uh, so the holding periods for funds are likely to be longer in clean climate tech as compared with any other sectors that one looks at say saas or something else right so yeah so apna so when you invest in uh, you know such startup sustainability clean tech climate tech, what factors you know you your focus remains you know in in those so i think for us we do only one thing which is climate tech right which means we look at the entire spectrum of founders across various spaces they solve for but also i think there is an understanding of having grown and seen the ecosystem today that there will be two types of innovation that we will see in the ecosystem there will be some process innovations which will bring in incremental changes while there will be also product innovation which will basically transform the way industries look today and for each of these you need to have very different lenses because the founder persona changes the capital requirement changes even the timeline that it takes for a company to scale up to a certain extent changes right so as we evaluate these companies our key factor is of course we have a fiduciary responsibility to our lps that we need to return capital and multifold which also means these companies need to grow in a certain time frame that our fund lives are so when we look at these companies we think about can this company create a certain outcome create a certain difference in next couple of years but given we are so razor sharp focus and we probably in our fund life will do 20 to 25 investments at max right for that we'll probably look at 4000 company and for that in the past we probably between the team have evaluated 5000 company invested in 20 and have some data pattern man matching to create at least 6 to 8 unicorns within the team from our past experiences right so use that triangulate that to identify companies which can really scale again sectors are exploding the first wave was really solar the second was ev now you're seeing plethora of opportunities across other sectors and i think one thing which has become very commonly understood in knowledge is digital got us to here it don't take us beyond what will happen is climate science will become the new computer science which means you will see new material new physics you talked about hydrogen you talked about new bioscience so we have to look at everything which means you also need to build technical expertise over time which is what we are working on building technical expertise understanding founder understanding how this founder which is process focused will scale versus this product focused founder will scale okay. so uh, if you talk about uh, the returns uh, you know for the investor how do you see this space sustainability climatic returns returns financial returns see for us i, uh, I mean I, everyone can speak for themselves but i think the industry as usual uh, typically looks at returning say on an average of 5x of the money that they have raised mm -hmm. right uh, private equity tends to do it at about 3 to 4x uh, for uh, venture it should be in the range of 5 to 6x so whenever we are evaluating businesses we have to see whether each of the investments that we do can give us that kind of an outcome right no 56x plus it has to be more than that right so within your portfolio there are always certain uh, companies that could become unicorns and give you that return you always do some amount of uh, you know tech uh, risk type you know investments where uh, it, the outcome could be binary and there are others which are you know as swapna mentioned you know slightly process oriented where you can you know give them the capital to grow and you know that they might not become unicorns but they could grow reasonably well uh, where we are concerned as cactus venture partners we uh, since we come in slightly later not very early we come in at you know series a typically and beyond uh, for us on an average when we look at businesses we say okay can they give us a 10x because if they can give us a 10x and uh you know we we then sort of budget for underperformance so in a worst case scenario can we get a 5x because that's what we have to return to our investors so that's what we look at when we look at each of the businesses anybody wants to add oh um, i mean of course the 5x 10x the asset class we see 
itself is, uh, you know, that if you are investing for a period of 10 years in a market like India, which is largely a fixed income market, and uh, when you say that, uh, you know, I'm going to be unlocking my principal and profits in this 8 to 10 years, uh, 4 to 5x is a given. Otherwise, you've selected the wrong fund to invest in. Specifically in the case of climate, the very nature of investing in any climate startups is signing up for a slightly longer duration than your usual period of uh, staying invested, not necessarily on the deployment phase, but to stay invested and to continue backing them in subsequent rounds. Uh, so, uh, returns for LPs are, uh, doesn't change uh, in terms of the expectation of uh, the IRR or the multiple, but I think it changes slightly in terms of the duration. And I hope uh, good good funds will compensate for that uh, in the upside on the percentage. Uh, <clears throat> so I will talk about like how, how we are thinking at a portfolio level or uh, how we are thinking about returns from our fund. So uh, the good thing about this sector uh, uh, is you have your tailwinds. I mean, complete industry is shifting, like, I mean, from a typical oil and gas or carbon emitting uh, 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 sources to that of, of clean and green sources. So you have your tailwinds at your side. Uh, from a fund, uh, the objective of Transition VC is to invest in 30, 35 startups over the next three years. And from that, what we have modeled is that if if we are able to, I mean, we invest at seed stage, and uh, uh, typically, if we can get one unicorn and uh, two to three mediocre successes, that is where we would be. The fund would return deliver a five to six x return on, on a base case, and uh, that's that's the base case what we have what we have modeled it. But objective of transition VC is to at least bring out three to four unicorns over the next four or five years. So, so we want to see that happening. And uh, uh, so it also depends like on the duration. So if you are investing in a uh, company which does materials that go into the value chain, you have long gestation period. But if you are investing in an engineering company that's already a systems play rather than a materials play, there it, you can build that system, take it to market, and there immediately you can clearly see a path over the next four or five years, you can easily become a 1,000 crore, 1,500 crore company. So a lot of our portfolio companies, uh, when we invest, we look at whether they have the ability to become a 1,000 crore revenue company over the next four or five years. And uh, thankfully, so far, most of our portfolio companies, what we have invested in using our proprietary capital into the fund, we believe that most of them are on the track to become at least a 1,000 crore company. So, so uh, that way, uh, I think this sector has the best opportunity to give more number of unicorns. So there was a, all, already a quote by uh, uh, one, one of the famous investors that this sector will see 100 unicorns over the next over de decade globally. So at least I am hopeful that we will see four to five at least uh, more than that unicorns coming from this sector. So definitely uh, this is an outlier driven business. One unicorn in your portfolio gives all the returns. So can I want to say something? I already covered it in. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? Hi, thank you. My name is Tia. I'm from Australia. I'm doing a PhD on investment in the link to impact, to comparing Australia and India. Um, I'm very familiar with the climate tech in Australia, which is now the hottest trend. I have a number of questions. The first question is. Um, is there, aside from the fact that you are investing in climate, is there a way that you structure the deals differently uh, because you require patient capital? Is there something different, aside from the actual investment in climate, that you do that differentiates you from a different v from regular VCs? That would be my first question. I, I can take that. I think um, you are bang on, right? Climate tech is a very different asset class. People don't understand it. Uh, and it's also patient because there are product innovations which will take a significant amount of time. I think there are two ways to solve for it. One is when you are underwriting the risk, you try and figure out ways to mitigate. The biggest risk in this segment in my mind is 
next round of capital because these companies need tremendous amount of capital you need to ensure that that shows up on the cap table which is why for us i can at least and i i think that's one way to think about it as at avana we think about an ecosystem approach that while we are putting in the first check how do we ensure that there is later stage funding available which is where you're talking to later stage funds all the time telling them how the companies are scaling also keep the money for value of debt so for every dollar that we underwrite we actually keep 2 and a half dollar aside to ensure that the company has a money when it goes through that value of debt so i think again very important point that this will be very different trajectories and once it scales it scales very well but you need to ensure you have time for that value of debt yeah, if i may add to that i think the, your question was also is this is the way we invest in climate a little different from what we do in other sectors right uh, I, at least for us there is no difference in the way we look at uh, investing in climate versus the others yes there is a certain uh, you know um, social cost benefit analysis that comes into it in the sense that okay if we are doing something what is the climatic impact that the business that we are funding or the technology that we are backing what is the impact that it is having at a uh, you know at a uh, esg level so so this uh, in the esg it's more the environment side Uh, there are the social and you know governance aspects also which come into the picture but uh, you know the only difference is we now need to with other businesses we look at it purely from an economical perspective but when we are investing in uh, climate and clean tech we then have to see what kind of impact we are making and we have to uh, you know objectively calculate that right so it's not just the capital that goes into helping the business grow it's about the uh, change or the impact that the business is uh, having on uh, the environment and you uh, know society at large you have any other question i have many questions i'm sorry <laughs> you can ask one. i'll ask one if i can ask maybe one more seeing that it's a very nascent um industry both from a vc perspective as well from a technology perspective what is your biggest challenge in terms of the like where where is your biggest challenge in terms of the pipeline is it in sourcing uh new investment opportunities is it in raising capital is it being able to figure out the impact like what is, what are your biggest challenges so uh two challenges specifically uh so one uh, always we are always thinking like whether we are timing it right so we always face a challenge like are we as a venture capital fund very early in this segment or uh, is it the right time to invest because if you are early uh, you invest and no action happens then the startup dies and at the same time we are losing that amount of capital so when since there is no precedence in this uh, uh, energy transition sector so uh, let's let's take an example so if i was an i would have been an ev investor like 7 8 years back and i would have invested in few startups most of them ha- I, i would have lost all my money so uh, similarly uh, if you if you have to give me an example of like let's say hydrogen value chain so it's always in the mind like am i am i too early uh that's that's the question i have to answer even even when it comes to long duration energy storage where we are bullish and internally we have a feeling that are we are we very early or uh, um, is that is that the question we are trying to find out and the second challenge is uh being in the market we find there are few niches unfortunately especially from the indian scenario none of the entrepreneurs are working in for example if you look at again again bringing back long duration energy storage none of the entrepreneurs are working non uh, working on flow batteries or hydrogen value chain or or in thermal batteries which are essentially required because i can clearly see that renewable contribution which is solar and wind contribution to the grid is increasing but no one is working on the storage so uh, if if you don't put up storage on the grid and if, if we don't have right technologies which are supporting the storage the grid will collapse at some point and that then we run into a panic mode and that can completely destabilize my solar and wind also those sectors also will get affected so a uh, challenge is this that's the second challenge so we want more and more engineers especially uh, uh to think about this kind of problems anticipate it and want more and more entrepreneurs to work on those solutions so these are the two like i mean uh, challenges what we anticipate as a climate tech or a energy fund where we don't have any precedence there 
happen other so if i may add to that uh, i think uh, challenges exist across various aspects right one is on the technology front uh, we we need to see a lot more happening on that uh, front to see uh, technology applications from an application perspective right the second thing is fundraising the ecosystem is not robust enough for that right we are doing a lot at the early stage but for us to consider exits at the next level when we get to a series c or a series d we don't see anyone who's focused uh, on clean climate tech or is looking at it actively saying i am willing to you know put in larger amounts of capital which means that they will purchase the stakes out of us uh, at a later stage so that's uh, you know it will take some time before the you know venture ecosystem Uh, becomes robust enough for people to come in at that stage uh, uh the most important thing that i see in this uh sector is getting a technology and commercializing it that is i think in my mind the biggest challenge because for every sector there is some problem or the other ev today we look at it it's subsidized right it's the government has to subsidize uh, the you know the oems for selling two wheelers and three wheelers the question is without the subsidy will a customer be willing to pay the price for the product uh, you know at the cost it, you know and whatever it costs it with a, a reasonable margin for a uh, profit margin for the manufacturer you look at look at water today there are companies i am aware of which have done things in the water technology space but water is considered to be a public good even the rich do not want to pay for water right they'll pay for everything else for food food is a necessity people will be willing to pay for food but water is a necessity people will not pay for water so you know a mindset change is required uh, which will take a lot that is one of the biggest challenges in this space let's look at municipal solid waste within municipal solid waste it's been happening for 20 years it's not now 20 years until today you do not have at source segregation of wet and dry waste maybe a lot of the you know residential complexes have taken it upon themselves to do it but outside of the residential complexes when you look at you know individual stand alone houses nobody does that right so it's a question of how mindsets will change where people will start saying look i need to take the responsibility to do certain things at my level and two i also need to pay for certain things because what is happening is that you know public goods are now getting uh, it's it's human nature whenever something is free you you want to use more of it you will not use it responsibly and that is the biggest challenge that i think a lot of people in the clean climate tech space are trying to sort of try and resolve or find solutions for uh, to make sure that you know uh, at at a you know a global level you know human kind can you know ensure that we are not uh, worsening our situation any further than where it is today